Ladies and gents, we have some exclusive gameplay of Hogwarts Legacy and big, big shout out to Avalanche Software for bringing the team down and allowing us to play this game early. Guys, we've been excited about being a wizard now, really since I was a kid. I remember reading my first Harry Potter book in fourth grade and that was it, man. I was done. Even at this point in my life, I would absolutely abandon my family to go to Hogwarts, at least for a little bit. Then the moment we laid eyes on Hogwarts Legacy, we all really wondered the same thing. Is this game going to fulfill all of those fantasies of being a witch or wizard, submerging yourself into this magical world in a medium outside of just books and movies. Now, we're going to have a lot to talk about over the next coming weeks before Hogwarts Legacy officially launches, but today I kind of just wanted to show you exactly what you're seeing on the screen, starting with character customization. Now, I have to confess, it's really not that super in-depth. You can't change individual characteristics, such as your facial structure, nose width, or even forehead height, etc., considering that there's competition like Cyberpunk, Starfield, Elder Scrolls, Final Fantasy, which all have pretty in-depth character creations, this seems pretty straightforward. Now, as someone who really just doesn't care all that much, I literally just plug and go. Hammer, which this is his captured gameplay, he likes to really go the route of truly customizing and role-playing his character. Whereas I normally just hit the randomize over and over again in other games and then name my character Bob Cross. Now, there are no frame sizes, as in there not being an option to make your character heavier or even thinner if, again, you're trying to narrow down on either a character that looks just like you or you're role-playing as something else. There's also not an option for a tall or shorter version of your character. Instead, we get an above average fit male or fit female, which if that represents you, then that's great. Again, this isn't the end of the world, but in terms of character customization, some people really get into it. As we think the process is more than adequate with a large variety of presets to start from, and after you actually choose a preset, you can then pick your skin tone and of course face shape. There's lots of options here, guys. So you can spend a lot of time here. And if you don't get it right, don't worry. You can actually change your hair color as well as style in Hogsmeade if you aren't happy with your character's look. Now granted, if you want to fix more fine details, then you just have to make a new character. Now I really like these subtle animations that your character does, like how the eyes snap and look at things instead of just moving smoothly, or how your character's hand might twitch just a little, and the voices all sound fantastic. You could definitely tell there was a personal touch on each one of them. Now for the Hogwarts tour. Unfortunately, we were not allowed to capture footage of exploring Hogwarts, but that's okay considering most of what we got to explore, we've already seen in the showcase footage, as well as a number of different trailers. Now, actually getting on and off of a broom or even a magical creature is really easy to do. It's seamless, it's fluid. However, we felt like the controls for the broom flight just felt a bit off. Instinctually, you'll find yourself pulling back on the right stick as you go up, as you do with any flight stick, but instead you find yourself diving straight toward the ground. So again, some inverted controls there. Granted, there could be some customization here, so maybe we could swap it around. But when flying, back on the stick is down and forward on the stick is up. And during this time, we weren't allowed into the menus during the hands-on preview. So again, no idea if we can actually change the controls up here or even inverting flight controls is even a thing. And considering we have a lot of muscle memory with other games on how joysticks and flight controls work, this is one of those things that's going to be hard to get used to if this is actually a permanent setting. Now, on that same note, we come from Destiny 2, where if you're riding around in your vehicle and you want to turn, you actually turn your camera while holding forward and your vehicle follows. And this is not the case in Hogwarts Legacy. Your camera controls are not tied to the vehicle at all. If you want to turn, you turn the left stick, and if you want the camera to follow, you have to turn the right stick too. It actually made flying around and doing the developer-led aerial tour of Hogwarts more of a chore than it actually needed to be. Now, if you want to fly up high and quickly, the broom here is also not your friend. This is where you're going to want mounts. Mounts can accomplish this, but this also leads to broom upgrades, which are going to be essential. Because flying around on an unupgraded broom took forever to get anywhere. The meter empties incredibly quickly, and the recharge time is very slow by comparison. Now, broom upgrades will be one of the first things we do in Hogwarts Legacy, but until then, we'll just be riding our hippogriffs. Now, from a technical standpoint, we were very impressed by the seamless loading of terrain and the distance while flying around Hogwarts. Everything looked just as beautiful and just as detailed as it does in the trailers. It was actually really cool to see firsthand and also having the ability to fly wherever you wanted to go. Now, after landing in the courtyard and entering into the castle, right away, we learned that the placement of the various flew fast travel points is very generous so that if you're naturally exploring the castle, you'll come across them at different junctions and focal points. According to the developers, this was actually intentionally done to make it easier for players to backtrack or get to wherever they need to go. Now, the spell you're going to use constantly is Revelio. This actually lights up everything interactable for things like puzzles, etc., and with outlines that you can actually see through walls. It also reveals hidden pages and items. And if you think back to things like Assassin's Creed with like Eagle Vision, it's very similar to that. Blue is interactable, gold is loot, and red, well, red's enemies. And enemies actually stay marked, which is awesome. Now, there was actually a couple puzzles 
that we came upon, one in the library and one in the clock tower that I actually took a little bit to figure out. It wasn't something straightforward. And again, this is like the initial parts of the game. So the fact that it didn't just lay it out for us, but instead forced us to look around for any sort of clues, giving us that aha moment. We're not going to spoil anything here, but it's good. This has definitely got us speculating on what other puzzles are going to be like in terms of difficulty. As again, that adds to the immersion of Hogwarts Legacy. Now I'm going to talk about dueling, more specifically the Cross Wands Dueling Club. This is actually a very interesting combat arena. We've actually seen it a few times already. You could duel either by yourself or even go in with a partner. Now what really struck us was how quick the combat actually is. There is a lot going on and it's also unforgiving. The more commands you have to deal with, the faster combat actually goes. And there's a constant mix of like dodging, jumping, and knowing when to hit those two is definitely important even in Hogwarts Legacy because a charging goblin or a troll is going to mess you up if you jump instead of dodge. Now Protego is your shield charm and when you're about to be attacked, you actually get a gold ring around your head. Now we knew about this going in. What we didn't know is that the ring shrinks to a point and then you get hit. If you cast Protego when the rings are lined up, you get a counter. And we've seen different counter attacks in other games, but this one feels really good to pull off. And you can also get immobilized, similar to how you immobilize your own targets, doing some of spells like Leviosa or even Accio. Now when this happens, you actually have a split second to recognize the symbol and then hit it. Otherwise you take some serious damage and in some cases are incapacitated for a moment. Now I do think the time required to actually react here should be extended a bit. But again, that's the point in this, guys. It requires some skill and reaction time is important here. By no means are we expecting you to be an expert in Hogwarts Legacy when you first pick up a controller. But there was a moment there where Hammer actually got frustrated. And one of the developers, Mark, actually stepped in and said, hey, juggle your opponents. It's all about keeping your opponents from being able to attack you. And when you think about it, like from a perspective of the movies or even the books, you don't really get just tied up in 1v1s, right? It's a combination of just juggling back and forth between all of them, keeping yourself protected and casting a variety of spells. Now, here's a tip for everyone. Use a spell like Leviosa to pick them up, three basic attacks, and then use Accio to pull them back to you. Three attacks, Incineo, three attacks, then bring it back to Leviosa. You can see how this combat loop works. And if you want to juggle an opponent and keep them out of the fight, never do four basic attacks between spells. That sends them flying down to the ground. Now, Cross Wands also has a training dummy you can practice on. The kid there who actually runs it gives you spell combos to try, and this is actually great for initial practice. Now, what we didn't see was any way to train with a dummy and practice what we want to practice. Granted, this may be something that's locked behind progression. Otherwise, it's going to get very boring practicing the same spell combos over and over again. With all that being said, all of us who experienced the game were pretty much tossed into the deep end with combat. And according to Mark, normally you'd have a chance to experience and master each of the different aspects like dodging, Pradego, all of those things before just diving in. But even so, guys, we found the quickness of the combat and the required speed to react to things around you to be a good thing. I was actually concerned that combat would feel slow slow or even drawn out or just be a button smasher. That is not the case here. Now I want to talk about the mission fire and vice. Big shout out to fire and ice. But essentially guys, wow moments are times in the world where something happens that the developers have put in to surprise the player. In this mission, we actually see a Doug Bog leap from the water and capture a stack drinking from the pot. No lie, it's pretty incredible. Now upon talking with Mark, it was confirmed that resource gathering is going to be biome base. So you might actually find leaping toadstool caps near forests and trees and roots and leeches for leech juice near swamps and other bodies of water, all of which is easily seen by the use of Revelia. Now, one thing we weren't really super big on was the jump from third person to the camera perspective for conversations. It is a tad bit jarring. I feel like the conversations here that were happened really didn't need to happen in this fashion while out in the world. And we noticed this a couple times, once in the first camp, also again inside of Horntails Hall's entrance, and again near the end of the mission. It would have been nice to just kind of remain in third person here, but maybe this is supposed to be for immersion, kind of a subjective thing on our part. Now, we were actually given a suite of new spells to play with for this mission, including Disillusionment, Expelliarmus, Repera, and Crucia. Now, Disillusionment was actually used to sneak around to petrify the poachers using the spell Petrificus Totalis. You can actually see it in action right here. You can play this game in stealth as you have infinite amount of time to be invisible, and you can even cast Revelio without revealing yourself. You have a number of spells at your disposal here, allowing you to either go full stealth and knock people out, or you can just go spells ablazing. Completely up to you. And I like that not one play style is being forced on you. Now, with that being said, at least initially, the AI does seem a little bit lacking in awareness, especially since those poachers are making a lot of noise when we petrify them and they fall to the floor or even breaking crates and boards. It would have been nice to actually see them actively investigate, but they really just paid no mind. Now, I will say that the AI during combat, this is where things felt pretty versatile. They're constantly maneuvering around you, making it much more difficult to keep track of, which is adding to that difficulty. Now, you can actually lockpick in this game as well, casting the spell Alohomora.
Sora. Now, it's not terribly difficult to figure out here with one line being tied to each thumbstick and turning into a specific location. And then hell, the gears then begin to rotate and then the lock is no longer locked. But apparently there's gonna be a number of different difficulties for these locks. Dude, I used to get so into lock picking and things like Oblivion or Skyrim. You get that dopamine rush when you actually get it solved. Now understand guys, we were playing on normal difficulty here and every hit was hard. You're constantly drinking your Wigan Well potions to keep your health up as just a couple hits from a goblin can put you down. Now granted, if you don't wanna have to deal with this level of difficulty, there are easier difficulties. Granted, I don't like it when things are too easy, right? It's something about actually having things be difficult makes you dive into the game even harder. Now there's actually some really nasty AOE spells that enemies can do against you that you either need to dodge or just outright interrupt. Literally a pillar of flame can take you out. Now the game has a variety of enemies that you can actually play against. One being the wolf and a magus who can actually transform into a wolf and do some real damage. Now as a note here, when you actually defeat the animagus in their animal form, they transform back into their human form with full health. Now another thing we really liked was that the voice acting in the game dialogue didn't feel forced. It was really well done guys. Characters like Poppy Sweeting felt like they were alive in their own different ways and the world really felt like it was lived in. The NPCs didn't feel hollow, which I think was a concern some of us had. And a lot of the side talking that's actually happening, at least in this play, they're about 90% of it was substance and not just filler talk. Overall guys, we very much enjoyed our experience with Hogwarts Legacy. Granted, we're already a fan of Hogwarts, but I think this is going to be a game that not only Hogwarts fans are going to enjoy. It was challenging. It seems to be very well polished. Nothing game breaking, at least that we've discovered. Room flight could definitely be improved a bit, but combat overall felt good. And more so than that, the world overall feels very rich. And that to me is what's going to be the driving factor here. We want that immersion. We want to be able to take someone that has never read a single Harry Potter book or even watched a movie and give them a truly magical experience. Or at least that's what I'm hoping for. So guys, I hope you enjoy this gameplay. We've got more to share in the next coming weeks. So stick around. Fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching. And as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right.